Okay, students. So let's continue and complete the first chapter, the living world for class 11. So we were discussing about the living world, what is biodiversity, which brings us to the next part, the species concept, which is mentioned in your syllabi. What do you understand by the term species? So species is basically a group of individuals where the males and females can freely interbreed with one another to form fertile offspring. That first of all, it's a group of like individuals, similar individuals or organisms. It's like a group of organisms occupying a specific area. So that becomes a population. So it is able to potentially interbreed, produce new young ones, which are similar to their parents. And this concept, this concept of biological species was given by Ernest Mayer, and I'm sure you will find a number of articles about it. And it is mentioned. Ernest Mayer is mentioned for the concept of biological species in your NCRT textbook as well. Coming back to the estimate, we were discussing about the estimate that, okay, the documented species are 1.7 to 1.8 million. The study of nature, which is the world's bestest scientific site for biology that you can ever, you know, encounter. It mentions the estimate to be above 8 million. But truly, since 80% of the world species have not been even discovered by humankind yet, it's unfair to give any value or equate any number to it. And of course, because this is a mind-boggling range of species and we have so many cultures and ethnicities and languages, one species or group of individuals may be known by different names in different cultures and different countries. For example, mango is mango in English. It is am in Hindi. It is amb in Punjabi. So I'm sure you can, you know, give me your comments in the section below and tell me what is mango in your native language. And of course, it can be very difficult to know that we are talking of the same organism or same species when we go to a new geographical area if we are not acquainted with the knowledge. So the scientists designed the system of the scientific nomenclature. So nomenclature means the process by which you standardize the name of a living organism such that it is known by that same name in all the parts of the world. So this is scientific nomenclature. The definition is marked in front of you. It's your NCRT definition. Please do memorize it. And of course, when a name is attached to an organism or a group of species or a group of individuals because of their identifying unique characteristics, this entire process of identifying their unique characteristics, assigning them the scientific name, this is called identification. But how has this scientific nomenclature been achieved? So we know that you know species are of different types. You have microbes, you have plants, you have animals. So when the plants are to be named, the international organization, which follows some set principles and rules to give you the scientific names of plants, that is called the International Code for Botanical Nomenclature. Very important MCU, very important one mark question. Animal taxonomist, so taxonomist, a new term. Taxonomist is someone who studies or is an expert with taxonomy. And taxonomy, we will soon be coming across, is that branch of science, life science, which deals with identifying characteristics of an organism, assigning it different groups, categories, and naming it. Right. So for animals, the organization is International Code for Zoological Nomenclature. And which organization do we have for the microbial world? Well, this is going to be our special question. And you can name, you know, just note it down somewhere. The International Union of Microbiological Societies. So, International Union of Microbiological Societies, you can say, is involved in uh, you know similar studies for the microbial world 
bacteria and you know monera and protists etc and i'm sure there are a number of organizations which are international and universally recognized uh, for bacteria and protists etc uh, that is your job now go and find out their names and memorize them for your neat mcqs okay and you know so we have discussed that you know there are plant taxonomists there are animal taxonomists so which brings us to the fact what is taxonomy so taxonomy is the science which deals with identifying describing naming and classifying organisms how do you identify an organism because it has some unique features i recognize a student because they may speak very well they may write very well they may be very courteous so i have associated a unique set of characters with them similarly for living organisms when you identify their unique features you describe what those features are on the basis of that nomenclature or naming is done and then you classify the organisms which means how um, can you categorize them or classify them in a typical group why or why not that would be classified and when this arrangement has been accomplished it has been done and when you then compare groups of organisms and you try to establish some kind of relation some kind of a relation between them that whether did they have a common ancestor or they came from unrelated ancestors that science of linking these relationships is called systematics so there are two terms now taxonomy and systematics they are very well mentioned in your ncert text as well please refer to the ncert definitions and prepare accordingly so we discussed that you know universal scientific names are awarded so this system was introduced by carlus linnaeus and he was a swede came from sweden and uh, he gave the system of binomial nomenclature so what do you understand by binomial nomenclature by means to nomial name nomenclature system of naming so for example right now in front of you you see this though uh, it has an error in the way it is written i'll discuss with you what it is so by means to so the scientific name has two parts the first part is the generic name or the genus and the second part is the specific epithet or the species name sapiens right so epithet means a description of unique characters right and of course in that time uh, those were the, the times of latin so carlus linnaeus he was a swedish explorer and naturalist naturalist is a person who studies nature is an expert in nature and it was him who is credited with establishing this uniform system of scientific naming and of binomial nomenclature and he is very popular he you know still one of his publications is revered and read by millions or in the scientific world it goes by the name of systema naturae which translated from latin in english means the system of nature so i'm sure you know you will come across carlus linnaeus uh and his works so and in your ncert the rules of nomenclature have also been discussed the first name is the generic name the second name is the specific epithet the system of two names its binomial nomenclature and still we have this for example mango's scientific binomial name is mangifera indica just look at the way it is written right the first thing that you notice is it has two parts mangifera generic name or the genus indica specific epithet the second part of the name the genus name is starting with a capital alphabet but the species name or the specific epithet is in running alphabets they are written separately there is a space and they are in italics now you and i when we write on paper we may not be able to write in italic so what we do we do we will write mangifera indica or homo sapiens which is human beings by the way our species and we will underline the generic name and the specific name separately okay and you can very easily go through these four rules which tell you about the nomenclature 
part and this is from the examination point of view a very important question right and sometimes to credit or to give credit to the scientist who was involved in describing the biological name or you know something with respect to the species the abbreviation of the scientist's last name may be found so if carlos linus is attributed to the scientific name for mango mangifera indica lin dot so we have abbreviated linus to lin and this is the way of crediting and you know uh, you know acknowledging the scientist's contribution so the nomenclature part is this but when you have name you have identified now you want to classify group these organisms into you know specific categories and groups how do you do that so this process is called classification classification can be basis on you know can be on the basis of unique characteristics characteristics which are very different for different set of organisms or sometimes based upon affinities or similarities as well so for example it is understandable that you are going to club wheat rice and mango under one group but you cannot put cats and dogs under the same group so you are doing some system of similarity and dissimilarity assessment that is classification and when you um assign a specific category this category is called a taxa a taxon the plural is taxa and this entire system of identify you know you know you know this entire system of uh, naming identifying classifying individuals this is called taxonomy so when you assign taxon or taxa or different categories to different organisms based upon their set of unique characters similarities dissimilarities this science is called taxonomy but when you study the relationships between these different taxa or different organisms that is called systematics it's a very common question students ask ma'am what is the difference between taxonomy and systematics so systematics stems out of taxonomy it is basically an extension of taxonomy and i'm sure you can give a good read to the ncrt text above and you know clarify your doubts so again systematics has been discussed and of course carlos linus with his publication systema naturae that is the system of nature and describes the various evolutionary relationships uh between the different kinds of organisms and diversities i'm sure these are very important mcqs and they have to be memorized and last but not the least the different kinds of taxonomic categories have been discussed in the ncrt so these taxa or categories are given a hierarchy which means ranking so you can either start from the top or you can start from the bottom i prefer to start from the top so i am very quickly going to take you to this page figure 1.1 and the page number is 10 so this figure is very descriptive so the first taxa or category is the kingdom then you have the phylum or division phylum usually in case of protists and kingdom animalia or animals division in case of bacteria plants fungi the next category or taxon is class then order family genus species sometimes the species can also have a lower category so under a same group of individuals you may have different cultivars or varieties so your job is go find out what do you mean by a cultivar what do you mean by a variety update yourself with these terms and in the ncrt all these taxa and categories have been discussed with definitions for example i'll take a very common example with you tiger the scientific name for tiger is panthera tigris for lion it is panthera leo and for the panther it is panthera panthera so my question is what is common among these three organisms that they have the same genus panthera but the species are different and look at this so in layman terms you can say that they are sort of cousins which belong to one big group or family of like individuals but they are very unique in their appearance and their behavior they are different animals they are different individuals so 
please go through these definitions they are essentially important for all of you to understand the concept okay students so it's your job now to go through the definitions of these uh, these various taxa taxonomical categories memorize them understand the difference uh, refer to figure 1.1 for better hierarchical arrangement or the ranking of the various taxa so you start from the topmost taxa which is the kingdom and you end up till the species but i would like to share with you that in your syllabi a concept is given that is the three domain or the domain system so what do you understand by the domain system let me just so explain it to you with the help of this figure or diagram in front of you all so uh, we know that from class 9th that all the living organisms can be categorized in five kingdoms according to the white picker system of classification that you know there is kingdom monera kingdom protista kingdom fungi kingdom plantae and kingdom animate however that was on the basis of whatever information for the morphology or external form of the body or the anatomy inner tissue studies physiology etc were known to us for different living organisms so when the world of biology became alive with the study of the molecules like nucleic acids like dna and rna proteins scientists had those take tools and techniques by which they could compare the molecules of different organisms they could for example compare the proteins of two organisms and more and establish if the proteins were similar or different from each other so somewhere around uh, in the later years there is a scientist by the name of Carl Woos and we'll be talking about it more in chapter 2 who proposed the three domain classification that it is better that instead of the kingdoms we should begin with the domains so the domain got added as the topmost taxa in other words you can say it like that so you have three uh, domains the first is archaea then i have the bacteria and then the eukaryota or the eukarya also in some books it's written so archaea means archaic oldest most primitive forms of living cells bacteria well we know all the true bacteria you bacteria under kingdom monera so what whitaker was doing was he was clubbing archaea and bacteria under one kingdom kingdom monera but what carl wolz did was he split it that no among the monerans there is a lot of diversity so we should have three different domains namely archaea the most primitive unicellular organisms again there are no nuclear membranes they are extremophiles i hope you are noting down these words somewhere extreme means either the the the, the habitat that they inhabit that's very extreme their living conditions are very extreme philly means affinity loving so they love growing in high temperatures or low temperatures or highly acidic environments or highly saline or salty environments so these are the extremophiles or the archaea bacteria had the u bacteria and cyanobacteria you know typical bacterial cells and under eukaryota the third domain kingdom fun protista fungi animalia and plantae were all clubbed so this became the six kingdom classification under the three domains so this is a more uh, more latest concept which is being followed and since it is mentioned in your ncrt uh, as in your syllabi it stands discussed so reverting back i'm sure you can very easily uh, recall what's a taxa what's a taxon what is taxonomy what is systematics what is the hierarchy what are the definitions you're going through and then we come across table 1.1 so table 1.1 gives you the scientific names and the biological nomenclature and the different taxa for these four organisms well one is our our own species homo sapiens then we have the common house fly omnusa domestica and then a dicot a dicotyledonous angiosperm like mangifera indica and a monocotyledonous 
and your sperm called triticum estivum or wheat. Now, from the NCRT point of view, from the NEAT point of view, you know, we are living in a world of databases. We are not required to remember everything anymore because everything is just a click away. However, from your examination point of view, I would recommend that you must memorize these four living organisms for their taxonomical hierarchical arrangements. But then comes the question, how have we decided to assign a particular taxon to a group of organisms? How do we classify? How do we um, ensure that they are aligned in those specific categories for that we must be using some methods some techniques so they are put together and called the taxonomical techniques or taxonomical aids so whatever methods and techniques we use we imply to arrange different organisms and groups of individuals in different categories or taxa and then arrange them according to a hierarchy based upon their unique characteristics, similarities and dissimilarities. These methods, tools and techniques are called taxonomical aids. I'm sure you can go through this. And let's quickly go through the types of tools and techniques discussed in your NCRD. And you'll be shocked to see that you must have come across or used some of these tools right from your childhood since you became inquisitive and curious about Mother Nature. So I am sure all of you have been to a garden or all of you have been to well a zoo or a national park or a wildlife sanctuary or some place like this where there's a collection of trees plants and animals and you'll be surprised to know you were a born taxonomist you know human beings have been doing this this categorization and this demarcation and this grouping since times immemorial we don't even know how way back in time can we go and know that so what are your examination point of views for example the first taxonomical tool which has been described in your book is a herbarium the herbarium take the word herb a collection of herbs basically you this is a very old technique in which when there were not much internet resources the world was not in your hand with World Wide Web, www, people would go for excursions to far off countries and continents or different states and provinces, which were very different in the geographical areas and climatic conditions. And they would bring or sample plants and animals from there, right? And they would make a museum out of it or a collection out of it. So a collection of plant specimens, which have been dried, which have been pressed, with something uh, uh, which ensures that they can be pasted on a sheet of paper. And further, these sheets are arranged in files. And these sheets are basically called herbarium sheets. So this is what a herbarium sheet actually looks like. You can very clearly see that this herbarium sheet has a dried plant specimen. The stem is there. The leaves are there. Some, if the flower was also there, it is no longer here, maybe it is damaged. And on this herbarium sheet, it is written which college, which state, uh, serial number, which plant is it, its classification, who collected it, from where was it collected, etc. etc. So, th this is the common information which you will find on a herbarium sheet. Different herbarium sheets compiled in herbarium files, herbarium files stored in a kind of a library of plant specimens that is your herbarium. So I'm sure you can read about it and gain more information. Many um, college and university library, you know, scientific departments still have these precious herbarium collections. But these days, you know, you have the herbarium in your cell phone. You'll be surprised to know that. Yes, try downloading an app like uh, iNaturalist or, you know, plant specimens or animal specimens on Google Play Store or your Apple phones. And you'll be shocked to know anyone can, you know, become uh, a taxonomist by themselves. Just, just click the picture of a plant, upload it on a software database and you will get a number of specific hits as to what could be this plant. So, but you again need a trained scientific eye for that. So, everything now is on your palm, 
in your hand just a click away. So this is what you need to remember about the herbarium sheet, what information a herbarium sheet carries. Then we come to how are living organisms preserved. So this is an organism which is no longer alive. So herbariums are for dried and pressed plant specimens. Museums are for animals, preserved plant and mostly animal specimens. So they have been preserved in preservative solutions like formalin. They have been dried. They are in boxes. Um, now this practice is very rare and very less. But still you may find museums uh, like a museum of natural history. You will find big dinosaur bones arranged in the form of a dinosaur skeleton. Um, so yes, her, museums do exist. And uh, they have a vast collection of fossils and skeletons as well. Fossils, remember past tenth, preserved, highly preserved remains of any dead plant, animal or microbe. And then what if you want to experience these living organisms in their natural living state? For that, we have the zoological parks and the botanical gardens. So botanical gardens is like basically a big area where you have a collection of living plants, different kinds of plants, herbs, shrubs, trees. You can have sections where only bamboos are growing. You can have a lily pond. You can have an area where only trees grow. That is called an arboretum. So what are the important botanical gardens? So the most famous ones are the Royal Botanical Garden at Kew, England. Then we have the Indian Botanical Garden at Havra. India and the National Botanical Research Institute, Lucknow, India. So I hope you will memorize these three botanical gardens for your MCQs, for your NEET. And I will take the liberty of showing you how you can visit the Royal Botanical Garden sitting at your homes and take a virtual tour. So this is the website for the Royal Botanical Garden, Q, London, which has the world's collection of 50,000 living plants. And this has been declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. You can just visit their website and click their virtual queue. Tour will begin. And you can, because of Corona, a lot of stuff is right now not open. So are these botanical gardens. And you can take a quick, um, you know, tour. These botanical gardens. Isn't it lovely? You don't even need to be at London to experience this beauty of Mother Nature. So I'm sure you will explore the website on your own. And then uh, we have the largest botanical garden of India. The actual name is Jagdish Chandra Bose Indian Botanical Garden located at Kolkata. Please remember its name for your neat MCQ. And then we go ahead. All of us have visited zoos, we have visited national parks. I mean, children love visiting zoos. I hope some of you in your childhood have visited zoos and these preserved areas. And then we come to the main, the last part of the chapter, where we are dealing with very technical taxonomical tools, like what is a key? So key is a taxonomical aid in which you have, um, on the basis of the similarities and dissimilarities of living organisms, you have a pair of contrasting characters. So you have a question which gives you two choices. Basically, a pair of contrasting characters. This pair of contrasting characters is called a couplet. A couple. A couple from a couple, a couplet. And this represents the choice that you have to make. For example, go out in the garden or look at a potted plant and ask yourself, the first question or the first couplet would be, can you look, can you visualize it with your naked eye or do you need a microscope? You'd say, no, I don't need a microscope, I can see it. The next part, is it fixed, is it moving, is it green, is it non-green? So likewise, you eliminate the wrong options and you keep on going down a key. And I'll just show you what a dichotomous key actually looks like. So it's something like this. So you will... Just have a better view if I zoom it in for you and look at this now. Okay, So you ask this organism in front of you, is it a plant, is it an animal? Okay, If it is a plant, you will eliminate the other contrasting character immediately and you will proceed in this direction. Then what kind of plant is it? Is it an algae? Is it a bryophyte? Is it a pteridophyte? 
you know what kind of a plant is it so taxonomical keys work on the basis of elimination and selection principle i'm sure when you read the ncrd text you will gain so i'm sure uh, you will now take on these definitions head on from the ncrt for the different tools and techniques which help you arrange different living organisms in different categories or taxa now we were talking about the keys and keys are a type of taxonomical aids which are very analytic in nature analytic means very factual they are going to assess facts and there cannot be two different ways around the same question so you will have to choose the right option and move ahead with it and i've already shared the image of a taxonomical key with you previously and of course we have four new terms over here namely flora manuals monographs and catalogs these are also you know documented ways or taxonomical tools by which you can easily help in identification and categorization the definitions are also mentioned over here i leave you with their memorization remember the tips and tools i have shared with you solve the ncre bag exercises they are very very essential i hope this repeat tutorial after my cisco class will help all of you who had missed the class and some new users to gain some clarity in the way you are going to cover the first chapter the living world in class 11 biology and i hope this is a helpful tutorial thank you till next time